Hello, and thank you for joining us here at Ask a Historian. I'm Matthew Wilkinson, historian with Heritage Mississauga. Please join us each week as we explore the history of the city of Mississauga. On this week's episode, in connection with Remembrance Day, we will explore some stories around service, war, and fallen soldiers. Like, subscribe, and follow us to stay up to date on all heritage happenings with Heritage Mississauga. Matthew, our first question comes from Elizabeth, and she would like to know, how many soldiers from Mississauga died during the wars? Well, thank you, Elizabeth, for the question. And conflicts far from home have shaped entire generations of people who have lived in Mississauga. A great number of citizens from historic Toronto Township, that's the forerunner of uh, the city of Mississauga, have answered the call to serve, and many never returned home. Some of our earliest settlers in this community were veterans, or children of veterans, of the American Revolution between 1775 and 1783, who settled here as loyalists and refugees. During the War of 1812, which lasted between 1812 and 1814, many residents volunteered to serve in the militia and participated in engagements along the Niagara frontier, as did indigenous Mississaugas of the Credit River. Though Mississauga itself has never been the location of armed conflict, our residents have been drawn to service in many, many different theaters of war over time, including the Rebellion of 1837, the Fenian Raids of 1866, the Red River Rebellion of 1869, the North Northwest Rebellion of 1885, the Second Boer War between 1899 and 1902, the First World War between 1914 and 1918, the Second World War between 1939 and 1945, the Korean War between 1950 and 1953, the Gulf War, Kosovo, and Afghanistan, just to name a few. During the First World War, Hundreds of what we call Our Boys enlisted with the Canadian Expeditionary Force and served in numerous battalions while others served as clergy and nurses. 96 soldiers from historic Mississauga lost their lives in the First World War. The war effort on the home front was also significant, both in terms of conserving supplies and providing labor during, for wartime industries. During the war, historic Mississauga was also home to the Long Branch Aerodrome, the first military flight training school in Canada that saw 129 graduates serve with the Royal Air Force and the Royal Naval Air Service in Britain. During the Second World War, once again, hundreds of our residents stepped forward to enlist and serve in the Canadian Army and the Air Force and the Navy, while several others served as nurses. 89 soldiers from historic Mississauga did not return home during the Second World War. On the home front, items such as meat, butter, aluminum foil, and gasoline were rationed to support the war effort. Women were hired in large numbers in wartime industries such as the Dominion Small Arms Limited in Lakeview and Victory Aircraft in Malton. During the Korean War, dozens of soldiers and seamen from historic Mississauga answered the call to serve, and we have one known casualty. Sadly, casualties from service have continued, and Mississauga resident, Trooper Mark Diab, fell in Afghanistan in 2009. There is a park in the city of Mississauga's Ward 6 named in his memory. 93 of our fallen citizens from the First and Second World Wars are remembered at Cenotaphs, War Memorials, Honor Rolls, and cemeteries located throughout Mississauga. Many of Mississauga's War Memorials predate the formation of the city and are connected with the historic communities that joined together in amalgamation to create the city. Additionally, many places of religious and community assembly created their own tributes and symbols of remembrance. Today, Mississauga continues to have strong connections to military service. Mississauga has historic ties to the Lauren Scots, the Peel, Dufferin, and Halton Regiment, and is home to the Toronto Scottish Regiment's Colonel Samuel G. Beckett Armory. We will remember the service of those who did not come home. Matthew, our next question comes from Bart, and he's interested in any information you have on the conflict that involved General Peter Adamson. Thank you for the question, Bart, and, and uh, yes, a, a long a, a long distance cousin, and uh, I remember your visit well many years ago. Uh, you know, looking at the life of General Peter Adamson is a fascinating one. Uh, arguably, as far as I'm aware, anyways, the highest ranking military officer to ever sa settle within what is now the city of Mississauga. But let's take a step back first to look at uh, Peter himself. 
Peter Adamson was born September 23, 1779 in Dundee, Scotland. He began his military career as an ensign with the 71st Regiment of Foot on July 12, 1800 at the age of 21. A year later he was made lieutenant, rising to the rank of captain by 1808 and major by 1814. Certainly a career path of a military man, rising in rank rather rapidly attested probably uh, his, his skill as, as an officer. Um, in, uh, he attained the rank of Lieutenant Colonel in 1816 and Brevet Colonel in 1817 and Full Colonel in 1819. There is reference to him serving as a Brevet Major General, but this has not been confirmed. Through decree in 1851, this is long after he'd retired from, from active service, he was gazetted a Brigadeiro, which is a Brigadier General in the Portuguese armies for past services. So he did his highest rank he ever attained was, was Brigadier General. However, his highest active rank was, was that of Colonel. Uh, Peter was loaned to the Portuguese army. Again, he was part of the 71st Regiment of Foot, which was a British military unit. Uh, he was loaned to the Portuguese army, uh, in, and I quote, to aid them in the training of the British way of fighting during the Peninsular Wars against Napoleon Bonaparte. Peter Adamson served in 10 battles that we know of. Talavera, Fuente do Unar, Cuidad Rodrigo, Badajoz, Vitor, St. Sebastian, Nivelle, Neve, and Salamanca. He was wounded once, a bullet through his hand, on May 3rd, 1811, at the Battle of Fuent du Nord. Peter was awarded seven gold medals for, for, for distinguished service, and also a recipient, only one of eight people to receive the highly, highly uh, coveted, or highly sought after honor, Order of the Knight and Towerin's uh, Order of the Knight of Tower and Sword, the highest honor in Portugal for his actions during the Battle of Salamanca on October seventh of eighteen thirteen. His Portuguese unit became known as the Hunters Battalion. Peter first came to Canada in eighteen seventeen. Uh, he purchased 200 acres of land, which was Lot 32, Concession 1, south of Dundas Street in Toronto Township. That is historic Mississauga. His home, which was built about 1820, was first called Toronto House after the surrounding township, Toronto Township, and later became known as Thorn Lodge. Thorn Lodge Drive takes that name today. Peter returned to Canada twice more, once in 1819 and then permanently settling here in 1821 after his house had been built. In recognition for his considerable military service and rank, Peter was later granted in excess of 2,000 acres of land in Peel and Halton counties, with additional acreage throughout the province, including 700 acres in the Norval area. Peter amassed impressive land ownings, with estimates saying at one time he controlled over 20,000 acres of land. Unbelievable. Uh, he chose to build his home and settle permanently in historic Mississauga in 1821. That's uh, when he last arrived here and stayed. Uh, in what is today the Sheridan Homelands area of Mississauga. And again, Thorn Lodge Drive takes its name from Peter's home. Thorn Lodge became a local meeting meeting place, a notary office, a gover and a government house until Chief, uh, until Chief Justice John Beverly Robinson built the Grange around, uh, around 1828. The Anglican Congregation, formed in 1825, first met in Peter's home. This congregation, in part thanks to Peter's extensive resources and contacts, secured ground for a church and graveyard in 1826, which gave rise to St. Peter's Anglican Church in Arendelle, the first service of which was held in 1827. Peter also used his considerable influences and personal connections to secure the services of veteran Reverend James McGraw from Ireland for the fledgling parish. In 1838, Peter was authorized to raise the first provisional battalion of incorporated militia, consisting of 300 men. He was appointed lieutenant colonel, which was the commanding officer of the battalion. His brother, Dr. Joseph Adamson, was the surgeon or doctor for the battalion. Under Lieutenant Colonel Adamson's guidance, the newly organized militia aided in policing the new territories, and as Justice of the Peace, Peter Adamson also mediated any disputes that were that might have or might have uh, risen during in Toronto Township and probably a large swath of southern Peel County. Uh, in 1848, Peter attained the rank of Colonel, and he served as a member of the Legislative Council of Upper Canada, his politician as well, where he earned the title Honorable. In addition to being locally known as the Colonel or the General, and you'll hear those, you'll read those references in local history, uh, he was among the founders of two villages, Arendelle and Norval, 
and two Anglican churches, St. Peter's in Arendelle and St. Paul's in Norville. Uh, Peter himself, of course, is, he's buried at St. Peter's Anglican Church in Arendelle, but if you visit St. Paul's, you'll find the Adamson uh, crest on the on the altar at St. Paul's, and, and the main street through Norville uh, switches its name from Winston Churchill to Adamson Street in Norville in honor of, of Peter Adamson. Um, the again, uh, the main streets, both Arendelle and Norville, carry the Adamson surname today. Uh, Peter Adamson, Knight of the Tower and Sword, was an influential and powerful figure in Upper Canada and shaped communities that were around him. He was buried at St. Peter's Anglican Church, and his stone is engraved with his family coat of arms and a list of the battles in which he which he served, as well as reference to his knighthood. As for his service itself, uh, his probably the most notable service uh, that he was engaged at the largest battle was that of Salamanca. Um, and in the battle, the Anglo-Portuguese army commanded by Lord Wellington defeated the French army commanded by Marshal Auguste Marmont. In the battle, Peter served as a, a, a captain and in some references as a major of the 4th Cacadores Light Infantry under the command of Brigadier General Dennis Pack. And he, uh, Peter is subsequently mentioned in General Pack's dispatches. Peter's company, which was again also referred to as the Hunter's Battalion, was a rifle company consisting of 123 men under his command and were involved in flanking maneuvers against their French counterparts. The Anglo-Portuguese victory at Salamanca opened the way for the later capture of Madrid and Peter was said to have played a significant role in the Battle of Salamanca. So again, thank you for your question and exploring uh, the life and times of uh, um, Colonel Peter Adamson, Knight of the Tower and Sword. Our final question comes from Abigail, and she would like to know if Canada has any connections to the Battle of the Atlantic during World War II. Matthew, what can you tell her about our connections to this historic battle? Thank you for your question, Abigail. And uh, yes, the, the Battle of, uh, of the Atlantic uh, has some connections here at home, but to give you a little backstory for anyone listening that might be curious, uh, the Battle of the Atlantic refers to uh, a, a, a theater of war during the Second World War. And uh, the Battle of the Atlantic was the longest uh, operating theater of the war, which really operated for the duration of the, of the war itself from, from 1939 to 1945. Canada played a key role in its operations through the Battle of the Atlantic, uh, in the Allied struggle for, for control and for its response to, the, to, uh, to uh, war against Germany. Uh, German submarines worked furiously to cripple convoys carrying crucial supplies to Europe. Victory was costly, however. During the Battle of the Atlantic, more than 70,000 Allied seamen, merchant mariners, and airmen lost their lives, including approximately 4,400 uh, uh, seamen and merchant marines from Canada and Newfoundland. Canada had declared war on Germany uh, a, a week after uh, uh, Britain and Germany went to war, and uh, Canada's declaration of war came on September 10, 1939. And immediately, Canada's Navy, Merchant Marine, and Air Force were thrust into action over what would become known as the Battle of the Atlantic. Canada's role was primarily as an escort duty for hundreds of convoys that gathered in Halifax and Sydney, Nova Scotia, for the dangerous crossing of the Atlantic Ocean. Other Canadian ports, as well as the port of St. John's, Newfoundland, harbored naval and merchant vessels that joined convoys. The first convoy, HX-1, left Halifax on September 16, 1939, escorted by, uh, by, by two British cruisers and two Canadian destroyers, the HMCS St. Laurent and the HMCS Saguenay. At the time, at the outset of the war in 1939, Canada's Navy was small consisted of only six destroyers and about 3,500 personnel, a third of whom were in reserve. To meet its obligations and its commitments to the war effort, Canada embarked on a massive shipbuilding effort, commissioning dozens of smaller warships, known as cor corvettes, which were about half the size of a destroyer and armed with only a single gun and depth charges. Their corvettes, which were quick and inexpensive to build, took on a significant portion of the convoy duties. In terms of local connections, to we have we have reference to to several seamen who who um, served in in uh, North uh, North Atlantic convoys, but we have one fallen from historic Mississauga, and it's it's on him that we have gathered most of the information we have. Leading coder Selwyn Arthur Adamson was the son of Arthur Murray and Gladys Hester Adamson of Port Credit, Ontario. 
Adamson, Selwyn Adamson had two brothers and one sister, Gilbert M., who served aboard the HMCS Protector II out of Sydney, Nova Scotia, David M., and Mary E. Adamson. Selwyn Adamson left school at age 16, having completed three years of high school in Arendelle. Selwyn worked as a reporter and a news editor for the Port Credit Weekly, and as an office clerk and Edifone machine serviceman for the Thomas Edison Company, uh, uh, Thomas Edison of Canada Limited in Hamilton, Ontario, where he intended to return after the war to continue his work. In addition to these jobs, Selwyn had, a five, had five years farming experience and had served as a deckhand aboard the SS Heron Bay Great Lakes Freight Steamship. Selwyn began his training with the Royal Canadian Navy on, in December of 1941. He completed his training on May 31st of 1943, at which point he was, to, he was assigned to the, to, uh, to the destroyer HMS St. Croix, which was tasked with escorting convoys across the Atlantic Ocean. The HMCS St. Croix was on patrol in the Bay of Biscay on September 16th when it was dispatched to, aid in, uh, to, aid, to the aid of two convoys which were under heavy German attack from German submarines known as wolf packs. During the 10-day battle that ensued, the convoys lost three, ex uh, three escorts and six merchant vessels, but managed to sink three U-boats. Selwyn Adamson was killed on September 20th, 1943, when the HMS, uh, HMCS St. Croix was struck by three, three torpedoes and sank southeast of Iceland. So that is our connection uh, to leading coder Selwyn Adamson, who lost his life during the Second World War in the Battle of the Atlantic with the sinking of the HMS, uh, HMCS St. Croix in the North Atlantic. So again, thank you for your question. And thank you for spending some time with us this week here at Ask a Historian. And keep sending in your questions as we continue to explore the stories of our city each and every week. Don't forget to like and subscribe to stay connected to us here at Heritage Mississauga. And, in reflection of, of Remembrance Day, we wish you a reflective and thoughtful Remembrance Day as we pay our respects to those who served, who fell, and who continue to serve. Thank you, and we will remember.